Hello there, Homeschool Nolan here, here to help you navigate learning in the digital age. Question, who would you say was the most important Chinese leader of the 20th century? Now most people I think would say Mao Zedong, followed maybe by Deng Xiaoping or even Chiang Kai-shek. But how many of you would say it was Dr. Sun Yat-sen? Sun Yat-sen or Sun Zongshan was the first president of the Republic of China and is often regarded as the father of modern China. I bring him up because unlike the other famous Chinese leaders, there's a Sun Yat-sen Memorial Hall or statue in many cities in con and countries around the world. I visited one of these Sun Yat-sen Memorial Halls for the first time in Taipei, Taiwan many years ago as a kid. I then visited another one in Singapore back in 2009. And just last month, when the former mayor of my city took us on a tour of San Francisco, I was surprised to discover that there's yet another statue of him in San Francisco as well. In fact, there are statues and memorials of Sun Yat-sen in at least seven different countries around the world. And he continues to be revered today on both sides of the Taiwan Strait. What was it about this revolutionary leader that there are so many statues of him in so many countries? I became fascinated with Sun Yat-sen and decided to find out. But to my surprise, trips to my local library and bookstore revealed that there aren't that many good books written about him in English. So to learn more about him, I had to read excerpts from at least eight different books on Chinese history. Like this one, my East Asia textbook from college, and a book from my father's bookshelf called The Sung Dynasty by Sterling Seagrave, published way back in the 1980s. Reading different books instead of just one single biography gave me different perspectives on the man. So who was Sun Yat-sen? Sun Yat-sen was born in 1866 in Canton, or the southern part of China. As a teenager, he followed his older brother to Hawaii, where he attended private schools. It was in Hawaii that he became exposed to Christianity along with Western principles of democracy. After studying in Hawaii for a few years, he returned to China and studied medicine in Hong Kong and became Dr. Sun Yat-sen. It was during this time that China, once the preeminent civilization of the world, was in the midst of its century of humiliation. Western imperialist powers were plundering China with unequal treaties and violating her sovereignty with their spheres of influence. Even neighboring Japan was colonizing parts of China and humiliating the once proud Middle Kingdom. And all this was happening because the corrupt ruling Qing Dynasty was totally inept and incapable of modernizing China so it could respond to the rising imperialist powers of the 19th century. Against this backdrop, Sun Yat-sen devoted his life to the revolutionary cause of overthrowing the imperial Qing dynasty and replacing it with a democratic republic. His three principles for China were nationalism, democracy, and the people's livelihood. In 1895, he was part of a failed armed uprising and he became a wanted man and was forced to go into exile. He first went to Japan and then to the US and then to England. He traveled the world raising support from overseas Chinese for his revolutionary cause. In doing so, he eventually became a bit of an international celebrity and the face of Chinese revolutionary revolution. But when revolution finally did come, and the Qing Dynasty crumbled in October of 1911. Sun Yat-sen wasn't even in the country, and he only read about the collapse of the Qing Dynasty in a Denver newspaper. Nonetheless, he made it back to China by December of 1911. And on January 1st, 1912, Sun Yat-sen became the first president of the Republic of China, but his presidency was short-lived. Sun Yat-sen may have had political power, but he lacked an army, and he knew nobody could govern China without an army. 
So after just barely one month as president, Sun handed power over to a military strongman who ended up trying to be another emperor himself, and this forced Sun to go into exile again. But this would-be emperor died in 1916, and with his death began the warlord era in China, with China divided up into pieces ruled by different warlords in different provinces. Sun himself returned to China to lead a government based in Canton in the southern part of China. He spent the last years of his life trying to build a strong and unified Republic of China. As a leader of the Republic, he tried to enlist the support of the United States and other Western countries. But unfortunately for him and his Republic, Western countries were reluctant to support a Chinese government that wasn't actually based in the capital in Beijing. Because of this, Sun then turned to Soviet Russia for help. Now, Sun loved China and hated imperialism, but he never gave any indication that he was a true believer of Marxism and class struggle. But perhaps because of necessity, he turned to the communists in Russia for help. The communist Russians seeing a huge opportunity for communist revolution in China, were only too glad to help Sun and sent advisors and helped him build a military academy. In return, Sun Yat-sen allowed members of a fledgling new political party called the Chinese Communist Party to join his nationalist Kuomintang, Kuomintang Party. In the last years of his life, Sun Yat-sen was the glue that held the communists and the nationalists together in China. But before Dr. Sun could finish his work of building a strong and unified Republic of China, he died of cancer in 1925. He was only 58 years old. Upon his death, he was practically deified into cult-like status. He became the father of modern China. But unlike other revolutionary leaders like George Washington or Mao Zedong, Sun never succeeded in founding a lasting government. So this has made me wonder, why is Sun Yat-sen so revered by so many Chinese on both sides of the Taiwan Strait and around the world? But then it occurred to me, maybe it's precisely because he died early that he is so revered. One of my favorite movies of all time is The Dark Knight. In this movie, the character Harvey Dent makes a memorable line. He says, you either die a hero or you live long enough to become the villain. Sun Yat-sen died early and became a hero to all Chinese people. But had he, had he lived, would he have continued to work with the communists? Or would he have eventually decided to purge the communists like his successor Chiang Kai-shek did in the infamous Shanghai Massacre of 1927? We will never know for sure, but chances are that had Sun lived, he would have eventually had to make a choice and pick a side. And by doing so, he likely would have had made more enemies and become the villain, at least to some people. But by dying early, he became a symbol of the hope and aspirations of almost all Chinese people, communists and nationalists included. And that's what makes him unique among history's great revolutionaries. China has certainly been in the news a lot lately. People today are divided over what China is and what China could or should be. Because of this, I think it's more valuable than ever that we study the life and times of someone like Sun Yat-sen, who was able to bring Chinese people together both in life and in death. Even though he died before he could finish his work, he still to this day represents the hope Chinese people have for a strong, unified Chinese Republic that stands for nationalism, democracy, and the people's livelihood. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.